Hey everyone, I'm Devin, your friendly neighborhood board gamer. This is Devin Talks Tabletop in the Play the Game headquarters studio. We've got Among Cultists set up here. This is published by Godot Games. It's going to be coming onto Kickstarter pretty soon here, just after the holiday season ends. And I just want to tell you about this. This is going to be a little bit of an overview and a little bit of a first impressions. If you're familiar with Deception or, you know, traitor games like Among Us, Among Cultists is going to be familiar to you. But where Among Cultists is different is it takes that formula that you see in the blockbuster hit Among Us and it turns it into a physical tabletop experience in which you are actually investigators trying to determine who the hidden cultist is that is trying to summon some dark powers. So as investigators, you are within the university here. And if you can see on all of these different rooms, they are loaded up with books. The good thing that investigators always need is extra knowledge. And so you are going to be going down to different rooms and you're going to be setting them up for success. So rooms start off with one card, but over the course of time, you'll add cards until you get to at least the threshold of three. And at that point, you'll turn a card over from not active as a room to active as a room. And if you just get a regular check mark there, then the room is ready to go. And if you get a check mark with an exclamation point, then that means that there is a chance that something could happen in terms of maybe a cultist coming into that space. And if there's ever a bad cultist that's in the room, not the hidden one, but a physical um, obstacle that you have to overcome, that cultist will prevent you from being able to activate that room and secure these books and bring them back to the bookshelf. Players in on the investigator side, they're gonna to wanna to bring these books back to the bookshelf and as they fill up certain sections, they'll gain points. And as investigators are able to get to whatever the point threshold is for that player count, then they'll be able to win the game. Now there are ways for books to go back and then there is an additional way for investigators to win outside of going to these rooms, filling them with success cards, hopefully, unless you are a mischievous cultist trying to kill everybody. Outside of doing that, the other thing that you can do is evaluate and investigate your, your peers that are in the university because everybody's moving around. Everybody has, where are they? These route cards. Now these route cards tell you um, legally what rooms you're allowed to activate on any given round. So if you are in the first round, you can activate rooms that are light blue and that are pink up here. Same in the fifth and the ninth round. And then in these subsequent rounds, you can go and activate different rooms. This doesn't restrict your movement. You can move anywhere you want, but it does restrict which rooms, once they're cleared, you can activate to see if you're able to take a book out of that room and start progressing towards victory. But the thing about the hidden cultist is they also have a route card, but they don't have to follow it. They do need to make sure that they at least hide their movements well enough to where an additional player might not be determining, hey, you've gone to the same room two rounds in a row and activated them two rounds in a row. And that's not legal, that's not allowed. As you can see, it always alternates between different rooms no matter what. So that does create some interesting movement puzzles and some observational needs from the investigators to try and determine and suss out who is the hidden cultist, the one that's trying to ruin their plans, trying to kill them, and trying to prepare for sinister evil to invade this world. There are several elements that are going on here that are gonna be familiar if you've played Among Us or if you know anything from that genre. You're gonna have different roles at the beginning of the game. So you're always going to have someone who is acting as the cultist. That's going to be symbolized here by this tentacle. And you're gonna have a number of investigators who don't have any role here and aren't able to use any seer powers. And then you do also have the seer who at night is able to wake up and know who the cultist is. So if you have the seer power, you know who the cultist is, but you have to be very careful about your role because if the cultist ever suspects you, then if they lose the game, they have a chance to kill you. And if they kill the correct person or identify the correct person as the seer, 
then the investigators also lose the game. So, got to be a little bit clever about it. As you can see up here in the cafeteria, you have the ability to call votes. When you're calling votes, this is the other way that investigators can win outside of bringing enough books back to score points. When you're doing a vote, you're going to go about the table and discuss your suspicions, discuss anything that you think is unusual, and just relate any observations you've made in an effort to make the cultist maybe lie in a way that is um, easily undone or determined, or just make sure that you focus on people's eccentricities enough and maybe you found your hidden cultist. When you do a when you cast a vote, everybody closes their eyes and they point at the person that you think it is, and then whoever has the majority of votes is going to be killed. And what's nice about that is you can kill a cultist, and if you kill a cultist prior to them meeting their objectives, then the investigators win the game. However, if you do successfully cast out the cult uh, the cultist, again they have that chance to point out who the seer is. So you do have that need to make sure that if you are the seer, you don't want to be so obvious in your accusations that they know that you know. You want to stay hidden in plain sight. On the side of the cultist, if you end up being this tentacle-shaped monstrosity that is hiding in sheep's clothing, then your goal is to kill people. And whenever investigators come into a room, if another investigator comes into a room and they're the only two that are in there, an encounter happens. And that means that players have dead cards and alive cards. Sometimes players can be dead and not even know it if it hasn't been revealed yet, which means they're moving around and acting as if they are alive and still following the rules for cultists who are alive. But the cultist knows who's dead. The cultist is aware of how many other investigators have been murdered by them around the table as they try to push towards the threshold they need to win. So in a six-player game, the cultist needs four of the five humans to be dead, four of the five investigators to be dead. So when you go into an encounter, you're going to have a certain number of these pulse cards in a pile on your character card. And that is going to be determined, the amount that's in there, by how many encounters you've had. But with each new encounter, each person will take one from their deck and they will place them on top of the other people's deck. And then if they're ever checked in a room, say someone comes in here and on their action turn, after they've been moving around and they're at their action turn, they may want to check either one of these two individuals because they said, hey, you guys just had an encounter. I want to make sure one of you is not dead. And so they can check that and they say, you know what? You've got two pulses. That means that you're alive. Or they might say, oh no, it looks like you're dead, at which point you turn into a ghost. Now, if someone is the cultist, they're allowed to lie about someone's state of living if the person is dead. They could say, nope, you're good, you're alive, to where the person feels that they're safe, but they're actually dead. And so that kind of keeps the murder count hidden or obfuscated, and it allows the cultist, if that's who they are, to maintain a certain level of uncertainty as to the progress that has been made towards the cultist victory. So that's definitely a major part of this game is the encounters, whoops, the encounters that you have in a room that have only two people in it. If you do have more than two people in it, there is a way to have an encounter if the lights go off because when there's three people in a room and the lights are on, you have a witness to anything that happens between two people. But when the lights are off, all bets are off. And so all three of these people would be exchanging pulse cards and then it's absolutely up in the air in terms of who gave what whenever you're shuffling through someone's deck and checking to see whether they're alive. Everybody has their own character tokens that are in there. And if you're moving around, you can move between three different doors. So there is a limited amount of movement. There's not 
any space that you can go to on the board. You have three doors that you're allowed to progress through. So if you're ever get, trying to get to a certain location and say I wanna get here, I'd go through one door, two door, and three door, and I would end up in that hallway there. And so there is something to keep in mind about programming in terms of figuring out how far you can get and where you need to go. And that is also one reason why there are duplicates of different room colors because as you know, sometimes you need to get into different locations even if they are far away from each other. So you can sometimes get into the same room but just a different copy of that room depending on where you are on the map. As I mentioned, there's a lot of elements that are going on in this game. You've got cultists that might pop up into a room. You've got a scary fish man that you can find out about later. And then you've got a system in which you go through where you move and resolve encounters. An event phase in which you draw an event that sees what might happen there. And so for that, this is turning on or off the lights. There you go. And then there are other things that will crop up in here and change the board state. But then after you've moved and done the event phase, you have the action phase. And on the action phase, you'll get to activate the rooms, check people's pulses, all of that good stuff. There's more to the game. There's other things that will be revealed. But this is just a rough example of how the game goes. And... Yeah, that's Among Cultists. In terms of my first impressions of it, now that you've gotten a little bit of an overview, my first impressions are that this is, just like Among Us, a brutal game that seems at times unwinnable for the investigators until you learn the strategies of piecing apart people's movements and their actions. So much of these types of games are social deduction. And I think that sometimes, even though that's a main element where you have different roles and some are good and some are bad, I think people forget the social deduction part. Sometimes it's valuable to call a vote even if you have no clue who the person is, just so you can get the table talking because the more someone talks, the more likelihood they have of saying something that is strange or unsubstantiated to the point where you can figure out if they're lying. So sometimes activating elements of the game without intending to be decisive and final about it is a way of furthering your knowledge around the table. And then other times, instead of doing a task which feels like is going to get you points, sometimes it's just better to go over exactly what someone else did to make certain that what they said is the truth. So for example, if two people go in here, maybe when they leave, you can go check to see if this person's alive or dead. And if they are, then that gives a little bit more credence to what this player has been saying all along. So, so many elements of this game are not necessarily following just the me mechanics of it, but are also figuring out the underlying strategies that make sense for both investigators and cultists and taking advantage of them no matter what role you're playing. I think that games like these have a learning curve and they also are beneficial to people who have played the game already versus newcomers because there is less overhead for someone who has already played the game and they're more able to just focus on the strategies. But there is a lot of excitement in games like these and a lot of enjoyable talk around the table. There are some types of games in which you're playing the game and you're focused on the experience here <clears throat> and less so about the conversation around the table. And that's not the case with Among Cultists because as you're talking, you're really trying to discern what everybody is saying and make certain that you know if they're telling the truth or not. Because if anything seems dubious, then you want to make sure that you harp on it so that they either verify or like revalidate what they're saying and you can confirm that. Or if it seems like it's a shaky, shaky ground that they're walking on, that you can start to, um, you know, figure out what's going on. This is a, a really fun title and it definitely depends on the player count. Certain player counts are only gonna have one cultist or two cultists and then you're gonna be able to see a pretty big swing in terms of the action that can happen. The more cultists that there are, the faster that they can kill. Maybe their threshold or body count that they have to reach to is higher, but it definitely does create a lot of anxiety because you are wondering, am I alive? Am I dead? How far is the cultist toward their, towards their objective? 
Or as the cultist, you might alternatively be trying to say, I really want to kill someone, but if I do it in this particular scenario, is it easily verifiable that I'm bad? And so sometimes as the cultist, you're actually slow playing the game because you want to make sure you remain out of the target, you know, of people's suspicions. And that is another element that you have to juggle depending on what role you're on. The events themselves change up the state of the game in a way that creates a lot of variability. And then the player count itself adjusts stuff along with certain elements like the route cards. The route cards dictate where you can go and what you can do, not where you can move, but where you can actually be of use to the team or pretend that you're being of use to the team. So this is something for investigators to always be mindful of. And then it's something for the cultists to be wary of because you always want to make certain, am I, am I playing correctly to the point where I'm not going to be you know, under the microscope in terms of my actions. So there's a lot going on. It's definitely ramps up the more you play and the more you get familiar with the strategy, the less you have to focus on the um, kind of mechanisms or procedures that you have to follow and more you get to focus on just the joy of being suspicious of the people around you. So that's kind of some of the fun of Among Cultists. This game is coming out. It's published by Godot Games. So if you are a fan of these social deduction games, if you're a fan of Among Us, this is the kind of title for you. It plays four to eight, and I hope that you have a good time when you play it. Let me know what you guys think. If you have any questions, hit me up, and I'll talk to you next time.